Mr. President. Senator from Alabama is recognized. I'd ask can unanimous consent to be able to participate in a, co a colloquy with uh, a number of my Senate colleagues. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, we'd like to enter into a discussion this morning about a very critical issue in this confirmation process, and that is the Second Amendment, uh, the right to keep and bear arms as provided for in our Constitution, the threat uh, that now exists to that right that's plainly stated in the Constitution, and why we think uh, it's worthy of uh, serious consideration. I would just say that most Americans are totally unaware, perhaps, that the Second Amendment and the power of the Second Amendment hangs by a mere thread. A two five to four decisions uh, recently have affirmed the Second Amendment, but had that vote been different, one justice voting a different way, the, the uh, Second Amendment would not apply uh, to the District of Columbia. Uh, it would not uh, be considered a... a uh, uh, a right that uh, would apply even to the federal government uh, entity like the District of Columbia. Uh, in the Heller case, uh, a, a more recent case in Chicago, McDonnell uh, versus the city of Chicago uh, dealt with whether or not the Second Amendment actually applies to the states and does it only apply to the federal government. That was a big deal. If it does not apply to the states, then any state and any city, and many cities are perfectly willing to do this, would have the power to ban firearms entirely. Even though the Constitution plainly says you have a right to keep and bear arms. And this was the effect of that decision. So, uh, Mr. President, um, I see my colleague, Senator Wicker from Mississippi here, and I'd like to ask him to, if he would share with us does he believe that Ms. Kagan's record would provide us any insight into her views on the Second Amendment? Because she would be one of the votes that would be critical in, as we go forward in the future as to uh, whether or not that amendment still has power and force. I thank the ranking member for that question. And I would answer yes, indeed, her record taken together with her committee testimony. Tell us a lot about... Uh, Ms. Kagan's uh, insight and, uh, and uh, feelings about the, the Second Amendment. Uh, let me agree with my colleague uh, from Connecticut, however, and say I, I don't believe it's necessary uh, for someone to have judicial experience to be an effective member of the Supreme Court. Clearly that's not called for in the Constitution. Uh, however, in a situation like this, where the nominee has never written a judicial opinion of her own, uh, where she has hardly any experience at all in the courtroom, I do think it is uh, appropriate and actually necessary for us to examine her life experience and see what insights uh, we can gain on her views on, on the Second Amendment. I would also say this. Uh, the, the debate is drawing to a close. Uh, the issue is probably not in doubt. But I think we owe it to the record, we owe it to our constituents, we owe it to the American people to outline our concerns with regard to the second amendment to the Constitution, to the second article in the Bill of Rights. So uh, uh, if the uh, members would indulge me by going through some of the life experiences that this nominee has. Ms. Kagan began her law career clerking for a very anti-gun uh, Judge Abner Mikva, who later brought Ms. Kagan to the White House to serve as his deputy. Judge Mikva once likened the National Rifle Association to, quote, a street crime lobby, unquote. Uh, next, Ms. Kagan's own hostility to the Second Amendment rights uh, became evident during her time as a law clerk for Justice Thurgood Marshall, where, uh, as a clerk, she wrote that she was, quote, not sympathetic to the argument that the D.C. handgun bill ban violated an individual's Second Amendment right. Uh, this is disappointing and troubling. Uh, in this memo, she didn't cite uh, text or precedent or uh, 
analyze the law or look to the Constitution, Ms. Kagan inserted her personal beliefs and said, I'm not sympathetic to this individual right argument. Uh, and the, the case uh, that that uh, advice involved was uh, Lee Sandage, a business owner who was arrested and convicted in the District of Columbia for possessing ammunition and an unregistered pistol without a license. The law provided up to 10 years in jail for this offense. Mr. Sandage's Second Amendment claim, the one that Ms. Kagan was not sympathetic toward, challenged the very same D.C. total gun ban that was struck down later by the Supreme Court in the Heller decision. Uh, Ms. Kagan's lack of sympathy for Sandage's claim demonstrates that she failed to recognize that we have an individual right as citizens to bear arms. And I'm uh, very pleased that the Supreme Court has now recognized this on two occasions, in Heller and also this year in uh, 2010 in McDonald. Then Ms. Kagan embarked on what can only be described as a quest against gun ownership and Second Amendment rights during her years in the Clinton White House. She worked extensively on gun issues during President Clinton's administration, which was well known for such gun control efforts. The record leaves no doubt that Ms. Kagan was a key player in shaping Clinton White House restrictive gun policies. During those years, she co-authored policy memos um, that advocated increased restrictions on lawful gun owners, including legislation requiring background checks for all secondary market gun purchasers, a gun tracing initiative, and a call for a new gun design quote, that can be shot only by authorized adults, unquote. According to the records of the Clinton Presidential Library, Ms. Kagan also drafted an executive order re restricting the importation of certain semi-automatic rifles that were not covered by statute. In other words, she authored an executive order that went beyond statute in her quest against gun ownership. At the, at the time of the import ban, a senior staffer who worked in the Clinton domestic policy shop that was run by Ms. Kagan described the administration's plan as follows, and I quote, we are taking the law and bending it as far as it can to capture a whole new class of guns, unquote. This was the office that our nominee ran during that administration. In addition, Ms. Kagan appears to have been in charge of the Domestic Policy Council's effort to respond to the Supreme Court's 1997 ruling in Prince versus the United States. The Prince case struck down parts of the 1994 Brady handgun law on Tenth Amendment grounds. According to the Clinton Library, even after the Supreme Court had ruled the Clinton administration, with Ms. Kagan involved, worked to preserve unconstitutional provisions considered in many legislative and executive branch responses to the court's decision. So I would reiterate what my friend from Alabama has said. The right of every American, the individual right we have to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment of the, to the Constitution hangs by a single vote. And I'm concerned that personal sympathies and a strong record of opposition to the Second Amendment would influence the way this person would act as a judge. But there's, there's one other thing, and I want to ask my friend from Nevada about this. During her testimony before the Judiciary Committee, Ms. Kagan stated that she had never had an occasion to look at the history on which Heller is based. And therefore, she could not say whether she believed there is a pre-existing individual fundamental right to keep and bear arms. Now, here is a talented and intelligent and articulate and, and brilliant um, law student and law professor and staffer who worked extensively on the issue of Second Amendment rights for years. 
and, and she taught constitutional law, one of the prestigious institutions of this country, and yet she stated in her testimony that she had never had occasion to look at the history on which this was based, and therefore she could not say whether uh, there was a fundamental right to keep and bear arms. I think her credibility was, was quite damaged uh, by, by that statement, and I would ask my friend Senator Ensign, were you, were you surprised when Ms. Kagan made that statement based on her extensive experience and, uh, and interaction about this issue? As a matter of fact, I was surprised, and I, <clears throat> I think that she did a real disservice uh, to her prior employers, uh, Justice Marshall, President Clinton, by not studying the history of the Second Amendment before she provided them with legal advice. I also think that she did a disservice to her students, one that a professor of constitutional law uh, would under should understand. Ms. Kagan confirmed the importance of studying founding documents when interpreting Second Amendment rights when she said during her Solicitor General hearing, and I'm quoting, the individual rights view and the collective rights view present cogent and sometimes powerful arguments. And I have come away thinking that immersion in the primary sources, which I have never attempted, would be necessary to choose between them with any degree of confidence. That's what she said. And she confirmed this when I met with her as well. Yet the choice between the individual and collective rights view was crucial to her work for Justice Marshall in the Sandage case and was certainly important to her work during the Clinton administration. For a question on that, uh, I heard him just say, and I and I, I would be interesting in, in having him confirm. But didn't Ms. Kagan teach constitutional law, and would it not have been uh, appropriate at that time for her to have looked at the founding fathers' intent on the Second Amendment? As a matter of fact, she did teach constitutional law, and I suspect that in the course of her career, uh, she came to understand why the founders included the words in the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I don't think that it was a lack of time or certainly a lack of ability to find this source material, but I su suspect that it may be more of her unwillingness to accept and ult ultimately admit that the Constitution and the Second Amendment, Second Amendment run contrary to her political beliefs. And I find this extremely troubling. And I also think that it shows this nominee's tendency to rely on her own personal beliefs and, and to read these into her decisions instead of the intent of the framers of the Constitution. And I, and I would say to my, uh, my friend from Nevada, it, it is troubling, uh, very troubling, and maybe even telling that the president would ask us to confirm an individual who admittedly hasn't reviewed the justification for the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights. Well, I, my friend from South Dakota, I think, makes an excellent observation. And this admission of her failure to study the history surrounding the Second Amendment is also in stark contrast to her emphasis on the importance of students studying international law at Harvard Law School. When when Solicitor General Kagan became Dean of the Harvard Law School, she spearheaded a sweeping overhaul of the academic curriculum to require law students to take an international and comparative law course during their first year. And when asked what specific subjects or legal trends would you like Harvard to reflect, she responded, first and foremost, international law. We should be making clear to our students great importance of knowledge about other legal systems throughout the world. For 21st century law schools, the future lies in international and comparative law. And this is what law schools today ought to be focusing on. Dean Kagan said, our goal then has to be to better equip graduates to be proactive and create creative problem solvers, to work with a global perspective whether the problem, particular problem involves a local contract dispute or an international treaty. And thanks to Dean Kagan, international law 
is a required course at Harvard Law for first-year law students. However, constitutional law, U.S. constitutional law, is not only not a first-year requirement, in fact, somebody graduated from Harvard Law School can graduate without ever taking United States constitutional law. Well, Senator, Senator Carl. Uh, ends, and this is a um, troubling thing. I know Justice Scalia has been a fierce critic of this, pointing out what foreign law, is, you know, what country do you pick? The judges get to pick their own. So I guess it seems to me, from what you said, it's clear that the president's nominee to our highest court in the United States has felt that this vague world of international law is more important than studying our own constitution? Well, I, I, this is the way it appears to me, and I, I think this is another example of where her personal beliefs uh, come in to affect the way that she is going to be as a judicial activist. Well, I agree, and I think uh, we must study what our constitution says what the people who wrote it meant, what rights the people retained for themselves when they created and gave certain rights, limited rights, to the federal government. Um, I do believe the history of the Second Amendment is important. What, what is the history surrounding the founding of our country and the drafting of the Second Amendment? I'm glad Senator from Alabama asked that critical question because I, I think it's, it is so important for Americans, people in this body, but especially our Supreme Court justices to understand. You have to remember the founding generation had just finished fighting a revolution against a tyrannical government. And they knew the true value of having an armed citizen population. Thomas Paine wrote in Thoughts on Defense of War in 1775, I'm quoting, arms discourage and keep the invader and the plunderer in awe and preserve order in the world as well as property. Horrid mischief would ensue were the law abiding deprived of the use of them. And Thomas Jefferson once said in a 1787 letter to William Smith, and what country can preserve its liberties if its rulers are not warned from time to time that this people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. Patrick Henry said, are we at last brought to such a humiliating and debasing degradation that we cannot be trusted with arms for our own defense? Where is the difference between having our arms under our own possession and under our own direction and having them under the management of Congress? If our defense be the real object of having those arms, in whose hands can they be trusted with more propriety or equal safety to us, as in our own hands. And in fact, if you take a cursory look at the 20th century, every single government that has perpetrated genocide has first disarmed its citizens. And it is my understanding that every known dictator who has come to power has followed this course. Well, did, you, did, did our founding fathers uh actually know this, Senator Ensign, and what was their intent uh, with regard to preserving the right to keep and bear arms when this language went in the Constitution? Well, I know that our founders certainly looked at prominent philosophers when debating the importance of the right to keep and bear arms. William Blackstone, who the Supreme Court has called the preeminent authority on English law for the founding generation, cited the right to keep and bear arms is one of the fundamental rights of Englishmen, calling it the natural right of resistance and self-preservation, the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defense. Judge St. George Tucker, who wrote the first commentary on the Constitution in 1803, described the Second Amendment as the true palladium of liberty. And he continued, the right to self-defense is the first law of nature. In most governments, it has been the study of rulers to confine, confine the right within the narrowest limits possible. Wherever standing armies are kept up and the right of the people to keep and bear arms is under any color or pretext whatsoever prohibited, liberty, if not already annihilated, is on the brink of destruction. Judge Tucker also said, if, for example, a law passed by Congress 
prohibiting the free exercise of religion or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to assemble peaceably or to keep and bear arms. It would in any, sense, in any of these cases be the province of the judiciary to pronounce whether any such act were constitutional. The judiciary, therefore, is the department of the government to whom the protection of these rights of the individual is by the Constitution especially confided, interposing its shield between him and the sword of usurped authority, the darts of oppression, and the safety of faction and violence." End quote. I would like to ask my, my uh, colleague from Mississippi, what did Ms. Kagan, though, say about this natural right of self-defense? Well, again, I would simply look to her own testimony. Um, and, and I think it's troubling, particularly for a law professor and someone who's dealt with this issue for decades. When asked at her hearing whether she personally believes there is a right to self-defense that existed before the Constitution, she said, and I quote, she didn't have a view of what are natural rights independent of the Constitution, unquote. Now, maybe Solicitor General Kagan was tired by that time. Maybe she had been told by her handlers, by the people at the Department of Justice, that it's the best thing to do simply not to answer that. But I would say to my colleagues, we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. We don't get them from the Constitution. Those rights are there. And certain rights are enumerated, including the Second Amendment rights, in the Constitution. And for a, a justice of the Supreme Court not to understand that uh, causes me problems and it causes me to think, uh, Senator Ensign, that, uh, that she just doesn't really have a, a, a very well-founded view of the Second Amendment. Well, I, I think that her, her statement was shocking. And, but also proves that she does not believe that the Second Amendment codifies this pre-existing natural right to self-defense. Her statement is in stark contrast with the belief of our founders, who fervently believed that the right to keep and bear arms was a natural right. Our founders discussed natural rights in one of the founding documents, this Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet Ms. Hagan does not have a view of what natural rights, independent of the Constitution. The failure to recognize the natural rights of, to self-defense as articulated by our founders and expressed in the Bill of Rights, I believe is deeply disturbing. The Constitution does not create these inalienable rights as the senator from Mississippi has said, it recognizes and protects these rights that are the, considered bestowed upon us by our creator. This, so, the senator is correct. The, the phrase right of the people is used two other times in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights, in the First Amendment's Assembly and Petition Clause, the Fourth Amendment's Search and Seizure Clause, and a very similar phrase is used in the Ninth Amendment, where the founders stated, quote, the enumeration of, in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, unquote. In, in all three instances, the framers were referring to individual rights, not to collective rights. Nowhere in the Constitution does a right attributed to the people refer to anything but an individual right. And it's the same with the Second Amendment, uh, this has been affirmed in the Heller case. Judge Sotomayor, when testifying before us, said that she thought that was settled law. The decision this year in which she dissented makes me wonder about that, and it, makes, it gives me grave concern in a five to four court about what might happen to uh, precedent and what I believe now is settled law. Let, let me just ask the ranking member 
during Ms. Kagan's hearing, uh, she was questioned uh, about her statement that she believes uh, precedent trumps original intent. What does this mean with regard to uh, the Second Amendment rights based on uh, pre-Heller precedents? It's um, a troubling statement, and I think clearly allows her to justify voting, if confirmed to the Supreme Court, to really eviscerate the Second Amendment. Uh, there are some earlier cases uh, before the 14th Amendment maybe was even passed or before the, 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 the first 10 amendments, uh, the Bill of Rights were applied to the states uh, in any systematic way uh, that you could rely on as precedent that could indeed trump, in her words, the original intent of the Constitution. What did the people ratify? They ratified the Constitution. And in fact, just before the founders signed it, they say we do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States, not some other, not some judicial opinion a hundred years later. So I think it does raise uh, troubling questions about where she stands on that. And uh, I am, uh, in the light of Heller and McDonnell, which were razor thin five to four <laughs> decisions all made within the last two and a half years, uh, that uh, we have to acknowledge that the Supreme Court is not with clarity committed to the uh, plain application of the Second Amendment. If I might just ask the, uh, the Senator from Alabama, because he's the ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, uh, and I know has dealt with numerous uh, nominees to the Supreme Court uh, in the past, as well as probably hundreds of other judicial nominees. Uh, do you recall how those nominees, or how often I should say, perhaps those nominees had a record on Second Amendment rights? Well, most nominees haven't had a record on it, but it is interesting and perhaps noteworthy that President Obama, who himself has not been a, a strong supporter of uh, uh, Second Amendment rights, and many of his uh, supporters and cabinet members are hostile to it openly, uh, the, the, the two nominees for the Supreme Court that he submitted, Justice Sotomayor and uh, Kagan, have had records that indicate a hostility to it, and even though just Judge Sotomayor in her testimony indicated she considered this settled law, the Heller decision, her decision less than a year later in the Chicago McDonald case on a similar but somewhat different issue uh, was uh, not consistent with a belief that the Supreme Court had settled the question in Heller. So this was a, a troubling thing and I think the Attorney General of the United States now, Eric Holder, has argued very vociferously uh, to restrict gun rights. Uh, uh, this is uh, the top law enforcement officer in the country. And uh, I do believe that this is a matter of some concern, uh, uh, in fact, that uh, we may be moving into a period in which the government, the big city in Washington, the elites who control this, who come out of an environment that uh, isn't comfortable with guns uh, are oblivious and insensitive to the right that I believe was critical to our founders in ratifying the Constitution. They wanted to know they had a right to keep and bear arms, and it was important to them that that be in the Constitution. Uh, Senator Thune, have uh, any of the outside groups uh, that are concerned about these issues, have they spoken out? about this nomination? They have, and I would simply say to uh, my colleague from Alabama that uh, in his remarks he noted the pattern that we start to see that exists here with regard to, uh, you mentioned the Attorney General, this administration, and their nominees to the Supreme Court. And what that has done, I think, is galvanized uh, those at the grassroots levels who are, are very concerned about what they see happening and how it might threaten and put in danger the Second Amendment right uh, that many of them have enjoyed and believe is something that ought to be protected 
uh, in the future. It ought to be protected by the Supreme Court. It ought to be protected by the Congress. It ought to be protected by uh, the President of the United States. And so you've seen some of these uh, grassroots people who are concerned about this issue give voice to their concerns through organizations like the, uh, the NRA, for example, uh, Gun Owners of America. And I would like to point out, if I might, that uh, both of these organizations have written letters in opposition uh, to Ms. Kagan's nomination. And so I'm going to, uh, I would like to ask Mr. President uh, uh, if I might have these uh, included in the record. Without objection, it is so ordered. And, and I might continue by saying that after reviewing Ms. Kagan's record and testimony at her confirmation hearing, that the Gun Owners of America concluded that, and I quote, the available evidence portrays her as a forceful advocate of restrictive gun laws and driven by political considerations rather than the rule of law, end quote. Uh, the NRA went on to write, Ms. Kagan's record, and I quote again, on the Second Amendment gives us no confidence that if confirmed to the court, she will faithfully defend the fundamental individual right to keep and bear arms of law-abiding citizens. For these reasons, the National Rifle Association has no choice but to oppose the confirmation of Solicitor General Elena Kagan to the U.S. Supreme Court, given the importance of this issue. This vote will be considered in the NRA's future candidate evaluations. And again, uh, I end quote. And so, yes, the, the answer to the senator from Alabama's question is both the NRA and the Gun Owners of America have opposed uh, not only this nomination, but also uh, Judge Soto, uh, Justice Sotomayor's nomination. And I would also ask, Mr. President, uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record the NRA's letter in opposition to the Sotomayor uh, nomination. Without objection? The NRA Senator. wrote in that case, Mr. President, and again I quote, Judge Sotomayor's judicial record and testimony during the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings clearly demonstrate a hostile view of the Second Amendment and the fundamental right of self-defense guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution. I would ask my friend from South Dakota, why is this so significant that both of these groups have opposed her nomination? Well, it, it, I would say to my uh, colleague from uh, Nevada, it really comes down to their horrible record on gun rights. It made it impossible for these two organizations to conclude that they would be impartial uh, constitutional judges on this is issue, even though they tried to convince senators otherwise during their confirmation hearings. These groups had their concerns about Justice Sotom Sotomayor validated on June 30th of this year in 2010 when she ruled again that the Second Amendment is not a fundamental right. Judge, uh, Justice Sotomayor has uh, assured senators during her hearing that she believed the Second Amendment guaranteed an individual right to keep and bear arms. But then in her first ruling on the Second Amendment as a Supreme Court justice, she joined the minority opinion in McDonald versus Chicago and failed to protect this individual right as confirmed by the majority of the court for citizens living in the 50 states. Now, specifically, at Justice Sotomayor's hearing, she said, and again, I quote, that she understood the individual right fully that the Supreme Court recognized in Heller and knew how important the right to bear arms is to many Americans and that she did not consider the right, quote, unfundamental, end quote. Now, this is in stark contrast to the opinion that she signed on to in McDonald that I said, and this is a quote from the McDonald opinion, I can find nothing in the Second Amendment's text, history, or underlying rationale that could warrant characterizing it as fundamental, insofar as it seeks to protect the keeping and bearing of arms for private self-defense purposes, end quote. Now, I know that many in this body, especially those that supported her confirmation, were surprised by what is a seemingly 180-degree turn. Now, I, while I had hoped uh, that we could trust her word, I was concerned that her record did not fit her statements at the hearing. I had concerns that her true feelings were much more hostile towards the Second Amendment right uh, than what she was letting on. Specifically, I had concerns with two different cases that she had decided as a circuit judge, including one after the Supreme Court had already recognized the Second Amendment was an individual right, where she held, in that case, that the Second Amendment was, quote, clearly not a fundamental right, end quote, and did not apply to the states. Now, there were some senators here at the time that were not as concerned by this record as I was and as some of the others of us here in the chamber were and went on so far as to say, and this was a quote from one of our colleagues, I do not see how any fair observer could regard her testimony as hostile to the Second Amendment personal right to, to bear arms, a right she has embraced and recognized, end quote. That was something that was said by one of our colleagues in the Senate 
uh, during the Sotomayor confirmation. Now, while what Judge Justice Sotomayor said during the hearing certainly gave the impression that she believed in the individual right to keep and bear arms, her pre-hearing record demonstrated her true beliefs. And I'm here today to urge those members that proclaim to strongly support the Second Amendment not to be fooled a second time. Ms. Kagan was asked about the Second Amendment on a number of occasions at her hearing, and each time her response was merely a mimic of Justice Sotomayor's statements on the Second Amendment uh, at that hearing. Ms. Kagan would go no further than to acknowledge that the important Supreme Court decisions in Heller and McDonald are precedent and settled law entitled to all the weight that precedent usually gets. Now, I believe there is no question that Ms. Kagan will follow in the footsteps of Justice Sotomayor and revert to the beliefs demonstrated by her anti-Second Amendment record rather than, than her posturing during her confirmation hearing. And that is the reason that the NRA and other groups who treasure the fundamental right to keep and bear arms, such as Gun Owners of America, oppose her nomination just as they did uh, Justice Sotomayor's. The only question I think that remains for us here in the Senate is whether pro-Second Amendment senators who voted for Justice Sotomayor have learned their lesson and will vote against the Kagan nomination. And I would just say to my, my colleagues from Nevada and Alabama that as the old saying goes, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And for the sake of gun owners across the country, I hope that they will not be fooled again. And so I would say to my colleagues from Nevada and, and, and Alabama, with all the unanswered questions that remain after Heller and McDonald cases, uh, are there not lots of reasons why those grassroots people across this country, those, those gun owners, those people who care profoundly about the right to keep and bear arms, uh, ought to be concerned? And for example, what is a sensitive place? Well, you know, who needs to, uh, uh, to register? There are going to be registration laws that are put in place. You know, what is uh, the issue of, um, how is the issue of micro stamping and the mandates or requirements that might be associated with that going to impact this fundamental Second Amendment right? You know, I, I would ask um, the ranking member about the McDonald case, and maybe he could go into some details about the, Mac the McDonald case and how uh, the significance of that when it comes to, you know, future decisions. The McDonald case was a um, hugely important case. Uh, it dealt for the first time in recent memory with the question of whether or not the Second Amendment, which had been held in Heller to apply to the federal government, whether it passed through the 14th Amendment to apply to all the states. And cities are creatures of states, so that it applied to, whether it would apply to cities. This is a big, big deal because it is not generally so much uh, the federal government uh, that's willing to deny gun rights, but certain states and certain cities seem very aggressively uh, willing to deny people's uh, Second Amendment rights. And so do you have a fundamental, and, and the question is for the court, is it a fundamental right in the Bill of Rights, stated a fundamental right, and if it is fundamental, it passes through the 14th Amendment, and all states must comply with it, like states must comply with the right to free speech and, and other rights in the Constitution. And by a razor-thin, five-to-four majority, uh, the Supreme Court in McDonald held that it is a fundamental right and does apply to the states, and no state, therefore, and no city can deny an individual right of an American citizen to keep and bear arms. Fun, big, big, important case. Justice Sotomayor, who suggested otherwise in her testimony, but as Senator Thune said, her record suggested uh, she would rule that way, ruled with the four uh, that uh, it did not apply to the states. So it was a big deal. In the McDonald case, from what I understand, there were several restrictions uh, put in on citizens when it comes to their Second Amendment right, paying a $100 processing fee, uh, $15 fee for each gun registered, undergo and pass a firearm safety test, which consists of four hours of training, one hour target range practice. Uh, by the way, it costs about $100 uh, for each one of those activities. 
undergo and pass a vision test if you don't have an Illinois driver's license, fingerprints, be at least 21 years of age or 18 years of age for with parents' permission, 45 to 120 day, days for processing, own only one operational firearm, re-registered every three years. I would ask the, the ranking member, why are these you know, restrictions necessary? Well, the question becomes, uh, does it impact uh, a fundamental right? At some point, it does. Uh, we've d decided you can't put a poll tax on people to say your right to vote. You have to pay money to have it. Uh, we, we, you don't have to pay people. Uh, you don't have to pay people for the right to speak out and, and advocate uh, beliefs uh, because you have a right to free speech. So I do think these restrictions, as they increase. Uh, can reach a point of uh, real denial of people's individual right to keep and bear arms. And you want to be sure that a, a judge not only recognizes that it is a constitutional individual right, but that the judge uh, recognizes that some of these restrictions that we accept and are legitimate, but some of them go too far. Well, I would just add... Uh concluding my remarks that that this issue is of critical importance. The Second Amendment, uh, without the Second Amendment, the rest of the Bill of Rights can go away. That's what our founders recognized. And so our car colleagues, before they vote on Solicitor General Kagan, need to understand that. And that's why this colloquy was so important today. I think we brought out some very, very important points. Uh, and it was an honor to be with my colleagues to discuss uh, Solicitor General Kagan's views on the Second Amendment and how that potentially could uh, impact her decisions in the future. And I would just uh, uh, close by saying as well that uh, I think in, a, in all cases you have to judge people not by what they say but by what they do. And, and clearly um, the record would suggest, as it did with uh, Justice Sotomayor, uh, a certain uh, hostility toward the Second Amendment right and um, obviously statements notwithstanding at the Judiciary Committee hearings um, suggesting a, an openness to this or acknowledging settled law or precedent or all those sorts of things were meaningless in the Chicago case with regard to Justice Sotomayor. And if you look at the, the long history of um, Ms. Kagan with regard to this issue, I think you can conclude where she's going to end up. And it is a critical, critical issue because these are five to four decisions. These are very, very narrow decisions that strike at the very heart of a fundamental uh, constitutional right that people in this country uh, deserve to, uh, to have their uh, leaders, both elected leaders and, and people on the court, protect. And I am very concerned about where that is headed uh, with, this, uh, with this nominee. So with that, I would uh, yield to the thank, senator from Alabama. Well, I thank my colleagues for this nice and invaluable discussion. I would say that one of the unjustifiable actions of the judicial activist philosophy that is too much afoot in America today is their willingness to completely be oblivious to plain constitutional rights, things that are flatly stated, and then to create rights that don't exist. For example, the Constitution gives the right to free press, but we had Solicitor Kagan testify before the, uh, uh, or arguing before the Supreme Court in defense of this campaign finance bill that a corporation could be prohibited from producing a pamphlet before an election that might be critical of a politician. I mean, that's what the First Amendment was about. It wasn't about pornography or flag burning, for heaven's sakes. It was about political speech plainly in the Constitution. Yeah, we had four members of the Supreme Court a vote in an opinion recently that said the, uh, uh, the government could ban uh, uh, the uh, pamphlets. Actually, another lawyer for the government argued you could ban books. The, the Supreme Court, by a five to four majority, did in fact uh, say that you could take a man's private drugstore, the government could, and give it to another man who had a competing drugstore. In other words, taking private property 
for private use. And the Constitution says you can't take private property except for public use under condemnation. A plain violation. Five to four approved. And by five, two five to four decisions, the narrowest of margins, we had the plain constitutional right that Americans have to keep and bear arms hang by one vote. And yet we have another example of a judge in California yesterday declaring that the Constitution somewhere says that you must recognize, a state must declare that a, a marriage, a union between same-sex couples had to be defined in the same way and recognized in the same way as, as marriage, even after California uh, had had a referendum in which millions of Californians had voted, a single judge with no clear constitutional authority at all, in fact, no real constitutional authority, declared it invalid and wiped it out. So I would suggest that the people who are using this court to promote their agendas need to be careful. Because don't think you can play with the First Amendment. Don't think you can play with the Second Amendment. Don't think you can play with the uh, constitutional right to have your property not taken by the government except for public use. And you can start wiping those out. What right next will the court come and take? What right next will the central government come and take from you? So if you love this Constitution and respect it and believe it is a great bulwark for freedom, prosperity, and liberty, I suggest there's only one way to handle it, Mr. President. Enforce it as written, whether you like it or not. I thank the chair and would yield the floor.